I would like to start right off the bat by um, countering what Mr. Buck said. Um, polluters have been paying in Canada for 50 years and you can go on the National Air Pollution Surveillance site and see and you can see that pollution has dropped dramatically in Canada in that time. Your present combined provincial fuel taxes, provincial and federal fuel taxes equal $170 a ton carbon tax. So you're already being ca carbon taxed to death. And um, if you look at all the different programs that are in place, Ross McKittrick did an assessment. He's an economist from the University of Guelph. And he found there's at least 37 programs that are out there that are dealing with GHG reductions. And uh, so we don't really need another tax. So just a bit of background on me. I've been in communications most of my life. As you probably can tell, I have a bit of a cold today. Sorry, hope I don't have to sneeze in the middle. If I do, forgive me. Um, I worked at Alberta Environment for a while in 2005. And uh, that was the year that the Sierra Club gave Alberta an F and they gave Ontario a B plus. Uh, and we were very proud of our air quality at the time. I think we had uh, very good or excellent air quality in Alberta, something like 93% of the time. So that's part of what got me going on the coal phase-out issue in Alberta. So just to uh, give you a sense of what we'll be talking about today, we'll be talking about the carbon pricing consequences for Alberta, coal phase-out, the economy-wide consequences, Renewables, don't be in the dark. Uh, foreign funding that's driving climate and energy policies via environmental, non-governmental organizations. Mm -hmm. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports, which is uh, Goldilocks for policy makers. We keep hearing glowing reports about how well Alberta is doing. I don't know about you, but this doesn't look very good to me. Uh, in terms of capital investment. This is from the Alberta government's dashboard, economic dashboard. In 2017, non-residential capital investment in Alberta fell by 6% from 2016 to 57.2 billion. That excludes residential investment. Spending on machinery and equipment fell 9.8%. Con construction fell 4.8%. And most of the 2017 decline was a result of lower oil and gas extraction investment, which fell 6.7% to 22.5 billion, while manufacturing in the province declined 30.7% to 1.5 billion. So that's got to hurt the people at NISCU and a few other places where manufacturing goes on. So uh, environmental defense claims that 2017 was a good year for Alberta's economy, and I say compared to what? Let's review some crucial changes in policy. The carbon tax. Implementing a broad-based economy-wide carbon tax had cascading negative effects on Alberta. Coal is a high emitter of carbon dioxide, so coal became a liability for investors and a perceived liability for the province in terms of GHG targets. But this led to a loss of investor confidence because Alberta, a sub-sovereign provincial government, decided to overturn federal legislation and it demanded complete coal phase-out by 2030. So just so you know that most of the old coal plants would have been offline by 2030 without us paying a penny. The remaining six plants, which are the newest and the high quality low emitters, low emissions, uh, high efficiency, they would have been able to operate to the end of their useful life. Um, when Keep Hills 3 was, was built in Alberta, it was the most advanced coal plant in North America. So uh, um, there, that triggered the power purchase agreement debacle because the in institution of a carbon tax triggered a change of law clause. And this change of law clause, contrary to what people will tell you, is in embedded in World Bank recommendations for how you structure these agreements. So that if there is a change of law, investors and plant owners have a right to demand compensation. And that's what they did. They dumped the uh, coal power purchase agreements back into the balancing pool 
and they demanded compensation. So Albertans will be paying Transalta Utilities $37 million a year for the next 13 years as compensation and they are legally entitled to it as far as I can see. I'm not a lawyer but that's apparently their agreement. So the problem there is that investors are gun shy of governments suing and that's what happened when the PPAs were dumped back into the balancing pool. The provincial government sued those companies. So you know if you're an investor, like really, is that what you want to go into an, a territory where there's a carbon tax and where the government is intent on suing you for not breaking the law? So why is coal a big deal? Well, as you can see here, these are from 2016. You can see that the supply of natural gas and coal to the power grid, this is from the Alberta Electric System Operator, was about half and half, with some small amounts from other renewables and the interties. Um, we own coal in Alberta. We own about a thousand years of it. It's very high quality. It can be surface mined, so it's less of a danger to people, and it's much easier to reclaim and restore that land. Um, and it's price stable, like over the long term, you'll find that coal just very gradually goes up in price over a century. Whereas natural gas, as many of you know, is quite volatile, it's a market commodity. And I remember in 2008, I was a career counselor, and I had lots of clients coming in who needed help from the Alberta government. The Alberta government was writing them $800,000 checks to pay their natural gas bill, because natural gas had spiked way up. So right now natural gas is low, but I talked with a trader about this and he said, you don't look at today, you don't look at tomorrow. Look 10, 20, 30 years down the road and think what would happen. So, uh, so coal cost us two cents a kilowatt hour at the gate. And uh, even though the Alberta government recently rejoiced that coal use in Alberta was down, well, we're just buying it from Montana and Saskatchewan paying a lot of money for it. Um, and uh, actually in 2012, Morrison Park did a survey for the Market Surveillance Authority of Alberta, and um, they found that there was no investor interest in wind and solar in Alberta because our power prices were too low. So that obviously means they must be going up. So is a carbon tax effective? Well, not in Norway. When uh, around 1997, after Kyoto, Norway implemented a very dramatic carbon tax regime. And uh, they found that there is actually only about a 2% reduction in emissions due to the carbon tax. They actually found other methods of working with industry were far more effective than a carbon tax and less of a burden on consumers. And we should realize that Norway actually runs on mostly hydro and most of their population is on the sea coast and sea freight is the cheapest form of shipping. Um, you can see on the map Canada is 31 times the size of Norway. So carbon tax is going to have a big detrimental impact on Canadians. Uh, we're exporting vast amounts of agricultural products, timber, oil, gas, minerals. It's going to be a killer. So some will argue that this is uh, not a problem because renewables and electric vehicles are the way of the future. Well, is that true? And if so, what would that cost? This is the cover of a recent report we did that shows uh, In the Dark on Renewables where we rebutted Deloitte Insights and Climate Reality. And now we have Bill Gates. So Bill Gates says that it's time to stop jerking around with wind and solar. He wrote recently in an article when financial analysts are proposed to rating companies on their CO2 output to drive down emissions. Um, he said, do you guys on Wall Street have something in your desks that makes steel? Do you guys on Wall Street, where is the fertilizer, the cement, the plastic going to come from? Do planes fly through the sky because of some number that you put on a spreadsheet? And Gates' favorite author on energy is a fellow named Václav Smil. He's a retired professor from the University of Winnipeg. He's written about 40 books on energy. Any one of his books are excellent. They're very easy to read, very thoughtful, and they give you a very clear picture of what works and what does not. So we have to ask ourselves, then why is Alberta putting in solar farms? I mean, if it doesn't really work, if Bill Gates says it doesn't work, maybe we should listen. This is an excerpt from our report. This shows the Brooks um, area. 
This is a graph of the solar potential in Brooks and demand. A common claim related to solar energy is that all we have to do is add a few batteries uh, to store electricity when the sun is shining and then we can give it back when the sun goes down. Well, since the October to February shortfall, as we see here, is 1,383 kilowatt hours, the house would have to go into October with 1,383 kilowatt hours stored in batteries to get through the winter. But that's more energy that's than is stored in 2,000 typical 50 ampere hour automobile batteries. So battery storage is clearly not a viable option. In winter, solar replenishment of batteries is very iffy because you know often we get a week or two of cloudy days. So you're not going to replenish those batteries with any solar. And it should be noted that solar anywhere north of the 35th north latitude is an energy sink. So we're pretending that we're reducing emissions here, but we're actually increasing them in Asia or wherever those panels are made. And how about wind? <coughs> well, this is Black Spring Ridge's hourly output for September 2017. This is also from our report in the dark. The orange line is the one week moving average, which late in the month drops to less than 10% of the plant's 300 megawatt capacity. Since startup in mid-2014, there were 98 hours in which its output increased by more than 150 megawatt hours from one hour to the next, as well as 94 hours in which its output dropped by more than 150 megawatt hours. So claims that Black Ridge Springs, Black Spring Ridge's energy would be sufficient for 140,000 Alberta households must be taken with a grain of salt because a wind farm can produce the amount of energy consumed by 140,000 homes, but it cannot supply them with reliable power, and that's what we need. So the real problem with wind is its randomness. It's completely uncorrelated with demand. If the Alberta government adds another 5,000 megawatts of wind power, then the total wind capacity would be about 6,500 megawatts. Typically, this amount of wind would randomly experience 80% uh, or more ramps once per week. So this would be equivalent of ramping up six and a half Shepherd Natural gas plants that we have in Calgary, ramping them up from off to full and off again. These plants are unable to do this over the long term. They may end up having to put in simple cycle gas plants instead, which from a CO2 perspective pretty much defeats the idea of adding wind. Because they keep telling us if we put wind on the grid we reduce CO2. But if you have your natural gas plant inefficiently ramping up and down, um, you're not really reducing a lot of CO2. But this person told us, well, it's never really been about reducing CO2, it's about building wind and solar with the new government statement about going 50% solar. And as Robert Kennedy, the environmentalist said, when you're building a wind or solar farm, you're really building a gas plant because that's what you need to back up the erratic operation. So why not just build the gas plant? Um, oh, storage. Okay, we're there. Thanks. <laughs> so there's an article on LinkedIn about storage for Alberta. And this is also written by an Alberta industry expert. And he said that, because uh, we had about one megawatt of wind for, you know, about uh, four or five days ago, for two weeks, we had maybe one megawatt of wind generated in the province out of possible 1,400. Uh, so we were importing all kinds of power from out of province. At one point, we were at an emergency level two in the province for capacity. So we were really like tapped right out. Um, so some people said, oh, we'll just have storage. That'll be great. He said, how much would that cost? Well, utility scale storage shows battery cost of about $650 a kilowatt for the system and $250 a kilowatt hour for the actual batteries. Then that's about 70% of the current cost of a Tesla power wall. But the cost to provide storage for one cold winter day in Alberta would be $69 billion. So, and there isn't even that capacity of storage units available in the world today. So, you know, these are um, 
hundred of billion dollar ideas that people are floating around. Uh, I hope that you will get a copy of this PowerPoint and that you'll have a chance to read this article. It's really, really enlightening. So there's a fellow named Ewan Mearns who runs a, an energy criticism blog out of Scotland. And uh, he was talking about the amount of storage capacity in the world. And when you combine all of it, leaving out pumped hydro, there's about 12 gigawatt hours, which is enough capacity to fill global electrical needs for 15 seconds. When you add in the pumped hydro, you can fill demand for 10 minutes. So the, these are, you know, the problems of scope and scale associated with electricity and the grid are way beyond most people's imaginations, but it's very important that we talk about them, very important, because these are billion dollar decisions. So if renewables are such bad performers, and even Bill Gates says so, why are we doing this? Well, we have some new reports that show why, and the reason is money. So money, lots of money to environmental groups who are advocating for renewables. And much of this money came from green billionaires, foreign billionaires. These are just the top 40 environmental non-governmental organizations in Canada. From 2008 to 2017, their revenues were over $11 billion, and there are many more ENGOs. And most of these are tax-subsidized charities, federally registered charities. So you're paying them to cut your own industry's throat in this province. So let's look at the story by the numbers. The top 40 ENGOs received about $11.2 billion. The Enviro Law Organizations, which are not on this chart, but they're in our report, received about 167 million. The combined revenues of the ENGOs and their Enviro-Law Enviro -Law counterparts was almost $11.4 billion. And the revenues received by the ENGOs and their Enviro-Law counterparts was 18 times the revenues received by all federal political parties. And over 27 times the revenues received by market-oriented institutes like the Fraser Institute. So you have a very small voice on one side arguing for some open civil debate and you have a huge green steamroller. Both Ducks Unlimited Canada and the Nature Conservancy Canada annually receive higher revenues than all the major federal political parties. A large portion of the funding to these organizations is also from the federal government. The revenue received by the Tides organization alone is more than the combined revenues of Canada's two largest federal political parties, the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party, over that same period. The David Suzuki Foundation's annual average income revenues sorry, exceed the annual revenues of the federal NDP. And eight ENGOs have annual revenues that exceed those of the governing Liberal Party of Canada. So what's behind it? Well, billionaires for cap and trade. Uh, Matthew Nisbet is a communications <coughs> professor uh, who's been tracking the Climate Works billionaires for years and their strategic philosophy related to climate change. Since 1991, there was a group called the Energy Foundation and those billionaires funded ENGOs to agitate for climate change policies that pushed renewables and carbon price and cap and trade. Uh, this is, you know, wind and solar create these renewable energy credits or certificates. So unless there's a price on carbon that you can attach to those RECs, then they have no value. But once you have a price on carbon, now that generation, those become valuable fake documents, you know, monopoly money. But it is a tradable commodity. Of course, you can't trade it. Only, only these companies can trade it. You pay for it because you're paying the subsidies. In 2005, 13 billionaire foundations formed the Climate Works Foundation in the US to enhance the message with uh, the objective to establish a global cap and trade program and to cause a sea change in the global economy. They didn't ask anybody if they wanted us to go through that. I don't have any record of them getting permission from the federal or provincial government that we agreed that someone from offshore should intervene in our policies. 
And uh, McKinsey and Company, which is the world's most influential management firm, was uh, reportedly paid $42.4 million in consulting fees. And we presently have one of the senior McKinsey people working for the federal government, advising them on policy, but he's only earning a dollar a year. Uh, so what's behind it? Well, it's the ghost of Enron. Enron was making lots of money on sulfur emissions trading back in the 1990s, and Enron was a key driver in U.S. policy on Kyoto because <coughs> they felt that the climate change debate centered on the biggest money plays. And those were the rules around emissions trading, the rules governing transfers of emission reduction rights between countries, and the rules governing a gargantuan clean energy fund. When we look at the Podesta Climate Works WikiLeaks, we, it reveals the breathtaking scope and influence of these billionaires on the global economy, and there's some links there. This program designed to win is online. It's been online for years, so this is not a conspiracy theory. It, they did all this right out there in the open. Um, and these Climate Works billionaires want to put $12 trillion in renewables on the grid worldwide. <coughs> They also have plans for multi-trillion dollar carbon trading markets in China, Brazil, and India. And um, renewables, as I mentioned, generate nominal complementary power, but their real purpose is to generate the renewable energy certificates. And so with a price on carbon, that's a bit like printing money. So when you follow the money and you read these documents, you'll be astounded. Uh, this graph shows how these guys have applied millions and millions of dollars to denigrate fossil fuels, to push electric vehicles, to push renewables, to push, push the climate change catastrophe scenario. So here, um, Climate Works Foundation shows that they grant about $60 million a year, but each of those big organizations makes their own grants to other ENGOs or other providers. In uh, Ezra Levant's presentation to us a couple of years ago, he showed a, a grant of $100 million. $100 million. All on the climate change hysteria bandwagon. Uh, we know that Bloomberg, for instance, who has vested interest in renewables, spent a fortune demarketing coal. He funds Sierra Club with a few million dollars and they run a phase-out coal program where they say you're all going to die from coal and the world's going to die from coal and because it seems to come from the grassroots people believe it <coughs> and again as I mentioned there's hardly anyone on the other side with this kind of money to fight back for common sense so now people will say well wait a minute what about the science we heard earlier that Mr. Buck said well you know all these scientists agree and Hundreds of thousands of scientific papers agree that the science is settled. And anyway, let's look at the IPCC summary report. This is the SR15, which was issued in October. <coughs> the objective of this report was to give policymakers some insight into the implications of a 1.5 degree C rise in temperature global warming. And Roger PLK Jr., who is a climate policy expert in the States, said in his Twitter feed that the report said there'd be no particular extremes in weather. But that's not what we hear in the media. We just heard we're going to have more drought, we're going to have more floods, we're going to have more extremes. So world media and the panel at the press conference reported immediate catastrophe unless the world spends trillions of dollars. But why is there such a disparity? Well, it turns out Donna Laframboise, a Canadian journalist, wrote a book called The Delinquent Teenager, and she found that a lot of the people writing IPCC reports work with World Wild Fund and Greenpeace, who are funded by Climate Works Foundation. And what solutions do they offer us? Well, let's see. Why well, spend trillions of dollars? <laughs> spend trillions of dollars on renewables. So, or how about a carbon tax? Could be anything from $20 to $27,000. I mean, have you ever take your car, taken your car in for an oil change and had the guy say to you, well, I don't know, it's going to be anywhere from $20 to $27,000. Like, this is ludicrous. It, I can't even believe that they put this in the press. But they do. 
And again, many people insist that renewables are the answer and dirty oil and natural gas and coal are dying industries, but it doesn't appear to be this, that that's the truth. Um, the first graph is Roger PLK Jr.'s. He shows that fossil fuel consumption has increased in the era of climate diplomacy by 57%. So uh, the other graph is from BP, and if you say, oh, well, BP is an oil company, you can check the same statistics with the International Energy Agency. You can see coal is going up, that's the gray bar, and that little tiny orange bar after that, the one you can hardly see, that's renewables. So there is some growth in renewables, but that's not going to power the world. So you can see oil is going up, gas is going up, hydro. Um, there, there's a demand worldwide. Canada is one of the top six providers of oil to the world. And we, we saw that graph earlier with this huge drop in profits um, that the fellow from uh, Reclaim Alberta showed. Well, that was exactly the time that the tar sands campaign started blocking access to market and also uh, battering banks and insurance companies and investors. And you'll find the detail on that in one of our reports called Manufacturing and Climate Crisis, that Greenpeace actually had a specific plan to phase out the tar sands, to change Alberta's attitudes against the oil sands, and to uh, change Alberta farmers and ranchers from appreciating oil and gas to wanting wind and solar on their land. This is, it's written in their grant document. So um, what about climate change? Well, our particular view is that the sun drives climate indirectly and directly. And the theory of anthropogenic global warming, human cost warming is based on just one element, CO2 basically, or CO2 equivalent. And uh, the idea that this carbon dioxide or the equivalents will lead to extreme or catastrophic warming. But when you look at the greater influence of the sun, on the tides, on the electromagnetic fields of the earth, on uh, cloud formation, all these other elements that are part of the climate system. The sun is driving all of those directly and indirectly. We're only affecting the atmosphere. And I'm not advocating that we should pollute. Of course we should not. We should put everything we can into reducing pollution worldwide, especially in Asia, because we have the technology now. This is something we could export as foreign aid but they actually want to use that pollution as a means of trading, of global cap and trade. So it's kind of an irony. And if you look at this uh, chart, this is from the IEEE. This is showing that one cubic mile of oil, the equivalencies of one cubic mile of oil in terms of energy. To, to obtain in one year the amount of energy contained in one cubic mile of oil, each year for 50 years, we would need to have produced these numbers of power units for Three Gorges dams, 52 nuclear power plants, 104 coal plants, um, 3,850 windmills of 100 meter blade span rated at 1.65 megawatts, or 91,250,000 solar panels of 2.1 kilowatt home rooftop system for 50 years. Every year, the world uses three cubic miles of oil equivalent energy. One of those cubic miles is oil, and that demand is only going up. Now, what about getting rid of fossil fuels and cleaning up the world and stopping climate change? Well, Professor Michael J. Kelly of Cambridge says that he asserts that the decarbonization that is proposed, or the rapid decarbonization proposed, would result in mass deaths. And there's a fellow named Blair King who writes the, um, a blog called A Chemist in Langley. And he did just a brief overview of what would happen to the lower mainland in the event that fossil fuels stop tomorrow. It would be chaos within hours. People could not pump gas. People could not buy food. All the food would be off the shelf in two or three days and it would be total chaos. People have no idea how the world is so dependent on uh, fossil fuels. And in the meantime, there isn't an alternative, not a suitable one. So um, this graph shows that 
solar biomass and wind for the most part unless wind is backed up with storage cannot support basic society. That's the line there of energy return on energy invested. Uh, and you can see that nuclear, you know, for every bit of energy you ter put in to make the nuclear plant, look at the energy you get back. So that would probably be our best option over the long term, although of course it doesn't work everywhere. You know, it, every, every form of energy is, is location specific. Roger PLK Jr. looked at the IPCC reports and he said, you know, really these are um, Goldilocks for policy makers because they're completely unrealistic. And sadly, because it's an intergovernmental panel and they always tell you how many scientists and experts they have working on it, people assume, oh, well, must make sense, they've got all those experts working on it. But, for instance, the IPCC relies on academic studies that use what's called the RCP 8.5. That is the most extreme scenario of potential warming. It's one that most scientists think is completely unrealistic. It assumes that we would all go back to burning coal the way we used to do it, which really, that's not going to happen ever. There's another element in their report. It's called BECS, or Biomass Energy Carbon Capture and Storage. And as agricultural people, I think you'll appreciate the ridiculousness of this idea that you would plant a crop, harvest it, and then burn it for energy and sequester the carbon from the burning in the ground. Um, this plan calls for, at scale, calls for land mass the size of one and a half of India, half the size of Canada. So this kind of biofuel operation was deemed by the UN Special Rapporteur on um, Food for Humanity to be a crime against humanity. But this is part of these IPCC reports. And this is a ridiculous idea. Why would you plant a crop, harvest it, and burn it, and sequester the carbon when you can dig up coal which has a massive energy density by comparison, and do the same thing. We're doing that at Saskatchewan, at Boundary Dam. So humans do affect climate, but in 2013 the IPCC issued a report that showed there had been a hiatus in global warming for 15 years. So that's continued to this point in time with no statistically significant change in temperature. So that's now about 20 years. And Dr. Judith Curry testified to the U.S. Senate about the uh, then President Obama's climate plan. And he had said that some may still deny the overwhelming judgment of science, but none can avoid the devastating impact of raging fires, crippling drought, and more powerful storms. Um, and she said, well, this premise is not strongly supported by the evidence. She said the science of climate change is not settled. She said the evidence reported by the IPCC weakens the case for human factors dominating climate change. And she said that the IPCC, the scientific part of the report, and the SREX, which is a special report on extreme weather, uh, find little evidence that supports an increase in extreme weather events attributed to humans. And weather extremes in the US were generally worse in the 1930s and 50s than in recent decades. And she presents all the graphs and charts to substantiate her statements. She also said that motivated by the precautionary principle to avoid dangerous anthropogenic climate change, attempts to modify the climate through reducing CO2 emissions may turn out to be futile. The stagnation in greenhouse warming observed in the past 15 years demonstrates that CO2 is not a control knob that can fine-tune climate. Uh, I did want to make you aware we're going to have uh, our annual event in Calgary at the Red and White Club, and that will be on April the 10th. It's a very good evening. It starts at 6, we have a buffet, and uh, then we have two speakers, and it's usually a pretty good time. So if you can make it, that'd be great. That's the Red and White Club at McMahon. And in continuation of this presentation, there's a bit more about Friends of Science, and there's also some other material on the timeline. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.